Hello and welcome to the Alatia Foundation podcast. My name is Nawid Jabarkil. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Giacomo Luciani. Giacomo is a leading Italian expert on the geopolitics of energy and is often cited in the media. He's known widely for his seminal contributions to the theory of the rentier state. He's the scientific advisor of the Master in International Energy Transitions at the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po in the French capital. Luciani was also a Princeton University Global Scholar attached to the Woodrow Wilson School and the Department of Near Eastern Studies. He's senior advisor to the Gulf Research Center as well. Uh, he is also a former Alatia Award for Lifetime's Achievement in Education winner. Uh, and I did mention before we started this, uh, Giacomo, that this was uh, personally a, a great time to be talking, given my uh, background studying the Islam in the Middle East and your work on the rentier state. So welcome to the uh, Alatia Foundation podcast. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. I think the, the uh, our public will have understood that I am now an old chap. Yeah, and from the time uh, that your um, seminal work came out in what, 1990, around that time, it's interesting to see how those Gulf countries in particular have changed. So let's start, if we can, then talking about your theories of the rentier state, how they relate to the issue of diversification of oil exporting economies. Uh, many people say the difficulty that countries find in pursuing diversification frequently attributed to something known as the Dutch disease. The Dutch seem to have coped fairly well. How did they overcome uh, those problems linked to the Dutch disease then? Well, uh, of course, diversification is not an easy uh, challenge. Uh, the, the peculiarity of the Netherlands uh, and the Dutch disease is that the Netherlands already were an industrialized country uh, when they discovered uh, gas. So the same uh, is uh, largely true for Norway, uh, so uh, these countries that already are industrialized have a much better opportunity to uh, maintain their industrialization than countries that start from scratch and have to diversify their economy uh, because uh, the uh, Dutch disease uh, means that they have a comparative advantage in producing and exporting oil or gas or fossil fuels and, and uh, therefore the market keeps pushing them back into that corner and, and, uh, and it's difficult to get out of it. And then if people think of the rentier state in more uh, modern terms, they probably think of the fossil fuel rich suppliers that aren't industrialized like the Netherlands or, or, or Norway. How are they coping and how has that changed this understanding of diversification and how difficult it is when you have fossil fuels to rely on? Countries that are not industrialized and are fossil fuel, rich fossil fuel uh, exporters uh, have a difficulty because this becomes a very large part of their income uh, and uh, of, their, uh, of the income of their state. Uh, the state relies on, on uh, taxation of the oil sector only. And uh, that then is difficult uh, to, to move away from. Uh, if uh, uh, the price, uh, the, the value of fossil fuels declines, uh, they will have to face uh, uh, difficulties. But this is a problem also for some uh, advanced countries, such as Australia, which is a major exporter of fossil fuels and dirty fuels, fossil fuel. And I just wanted to get your sense on what you think is key for those countries that have seemed to have done better. If you take, for example, the United Arab Emirates or Qatar, looking at what's happened there with with the proceeds of fossil fuels, compare it to somewhere like uh, Venezuela or even closer to, to, to those countries, somewhere like Oman. What's key, do you think? Is it leadership or the size of the population? What makes certain that diversification can happen? I think some countries have uh, uh, engaged uh, in uh, diversification at an early stage and have pursued uh, uh, this policy with consistency and they have obtained the results. Many other countries, unfortunately, have never truly engaged in this uh, uh, path and at the moment they are facing uh, uh, significant difficulties or they have made uh, mistakes in implementing uh, their attempts at diversification and Venezuela is a clear example. 
so we have positive examples. I might quote Malaysia, I might quote uh, Indonesia, and of course, uh, uh, some of the Gulf countries have had also uh, quite remarkable successes, not sufficient, but quite significant su successes. But many other countries uh, have not. I mean, you just need to think of Libya or Iraq or even Algeria, you know, the, the process of diversification has been uh, very insufficient. And we could talk about this. Well, I could personally talk about this for a very long time, but let's move on to your opinions on other matters. The talk is now very much about the effects of climate change and the need for the energy transition, particularly looking at the energy trilemma, which we'll touch upon in a bit. Uh, just more broadly, how do you think the transition is progressing and is limiting the world's temperature rise to one and a half degrees Celsius by the middle of this century really achievable? Well, uh, it's, it is certainly a very major challenge. It's very difficult to achieve uh, the target by 2050, uh, which doesn't mean that we should abandon uh, uh, the pursuit of the target. This is the most important thing. I, I, I tend to, to uh, not attribute too much importance to, to the specific target and the specific time. Uh, what is important is uh, to be aware of the fact that the effort needs to be very much intensified relative to what we have been doing even recently. And one way to intensify that is renewable energy production. Hydropower is really important to that. But uh, do you think that longer term, some of the uh, progress in renewable energy production could be endangered by climate change, particularly when you look at things like hydropower? Yes, uh, climate change may have some impact on hydropower. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that one should not pursue it, in my opinion. Uh, there is vast potential for hydropower, untapped poten potential for hydropower uh, in Africa, in Latin America, and, and that uh, needs to be uh, exploited, I believe, because it is uh, uh, a dispatchable renewable source. It's a renewable source that we largely can control and make sure that uh, it produces electricity when we need it, which is different from solar and wind, which we cannot uh, control. And the current debate, we're uh, approaching, quickly approaching COP28 in Dubai uh, after Sharm el Sheikh, uh, back again in the Middle East COP after the um, one in Doha, in Qatar, and the current debate seems to have moved a lot towards the needs for adaptation and then mitigation as well. Do you think that that's the best way to try and uh, look at this topic, particularly with lots of countries agreeing that mitigation ought to be prioritised, but what you hear from the most affected countries, uh, often the world's poorest ones, is that adaptation is where the focus needs to be? Uh, it has been argued, uh, and I think it is correct to say that uh, mitigation is cheaper than adaptation, and so it is better to move quickly and mitigate uh, rather than wait uh, for the catastrophes uh, to happen and, and, and uh, invest in adaptation. That said, to some extent, you know, we need both uh, mitigation and adaptation. Countries are uh, uh, investing in both, and uh, so the discussion is uh, irrelevant after a, a certain point. The challenge of uh, channeling investment towards uh, the emerging countries, uh, be it for mitigation or adaptation, is a very major one and it is probably the most important uh, unresolved issue at the moment. And uh, partly that's because of politics. Often energy industry, traditionally, we started this uh, podcast off talking about the uh, political decisions that, that, that affect the, the way the energy industry is developed and how people can benefit from that. It seems to be inextricably linked, the energy industry and politics. Uh, do you think that's going to continue moving forward or do we need to try and take a more technical understanding if we're going to combat climate change? Of course, you need technical understanding. Uh, however, you know, I think it is inevitable that energy uh, be a subject of political attention because it's so important uh, in the domestic industry, in, in the domestic economy of each and every country. 
Having said that, some people believe that we will have uh, less of international trade in, in, in energy products, and so it might become less relevant in terms of international relations. I am not convinced that this is going to be the case, uh, because I believe that uh, some other forms of energy, such as nuclear or uh, international trade in electricity will play a major role. We mentioned hydro, hydro as well as a strong international relations uh, uh, impact. So uh, I think energy will continue to be uh, a topic for political attention for, for the future. And just to pick up on that, what, what specifically do you, do you see as the challenges and threats coming up in a world where renewable energy production or local energy production is, is intensified in, in the industrial world at least? Uh, where's the threats going to come when it comes to the political effects on the energy industry? I think, uh, you know, there are uh, delicate implications of uh, interconnections of, of electricity, especially over long distances. Some people speak of uh, very long interconnecting entire continents. And uh, however, um, you know, the experience uh, uh, tells us that sometimes uh, these interconnections fail and the difference uh, between electricity and other forms of uh, uh, energy is that uh, it needs to be uh, provided in real time. So there's, it's extremely difficult to store it. Uh, so uh, uh, you may interrupt uh, oil exports, but presumably people are capable of storing it or rearranging flows. Uh, for electricity, this is much, much more challenging. Yeah, that's true. And we saw with the uh, war in Ukraine, for example, in, in uh, recent years, the, the impact of how important that storage and usage is of, of energy and the political uh, impact that it has in particular. Uh, when you look at the energy transition, then it seems to be gathering pace, some very aggressive targets, some would say, looking at how uh, that decarbonisation process happens. Let's take it back then to those countries that rely on fossil fuel exports. Uh, presumably, there'll be lots of stranded assets in in those countries when it comes to their economies. And uh, do you think that's just a, a natural uh, corollary here of what's going to happen? And if that does happen and the price of fossil fuels falls, what will that do? It's going to be a significant challenge for rentier economies. I think uh, I don't like uh, uh, the definition of stranded assets in the sense, you know, it gives the impression that there is an asset that has value up to a certain point and then all of a sudden loses value completely. I don't think that is going to be the case. Uh, it, it is possible that assets lose value in the sense that uh, uh, the production uh, that you get from those assets uh, becomes uh, less valuable, has uh, less demand and loses uh, uh, purchasing power, so to speak. But uh, this will be a gradual process and so uh, I don't think uh, there will be uh, uh, some dramatic uh, point of uh, collapse when all the assets uh, are uh, stranded and, and there is no uh, adaptation possible. Yeah? yeah, and we're seeing lots of those major uh, oil and gas or energy producers also try and uh, move towards more sustainable forms of production, so perhaps some form of um, innovation taking place there to, to avoid those so-called stranded assets, as you say. We also, um, I mentioned the energy trilemma earlier that, that seems to be dominating the, the conversation, at least in some circles globally, that's looking at the energy industry and its need to supply sustainable, affordable and secure supply of energy. How uh, are various major consuming countries coping with the trilemma, do you think, given where you are? Well, it is clear that uh, until uh, perhaps two or three years ago, uh, the attention was very much on, on uh, sustainability. Uh, in the past uh, couple of years, uh, security of supply has acquired a lot of prominence uh, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, there is also greater awareness of the fact that the energy transition will be costly and uh, therefore there is a problem of affordability because uh, uh, it is not uh, clear and not easy to decide who is to uh, bear the cost of the transition. Is it the final consumer? Is it uh, 
uh, companies? Is it the state? Uh, this is creating some uh, difficult uh, dilemmas for policymakers uh, in the consuming countries. And the situation in Ukraine, perhaps the, the clearest example we've seen of that, as many uh, European countries decided to either turn back to um, more carbon emitting sources of energy or even try to fly abroad and secure new supplies. Uh, has the political response in Europe, do you think, shifted from transition issues to security of supply? Uh, we saw those targets sort of take a back step in terms of the political expediency of having to get supply and keep costs down. Do you think that's a short term effect? And once gas supplies are uh, are then back to where they are in terms of security, those considerations will will evaporate? No, I don't think it's a short term effect. I think it is something that uh, will influence behavior for uh, many years down the road. Uh, it uh, does not mean that we are uh, abandoning uh, the importance that is attributed to climate change and, and to the energy transition, but it certainly means a greater politicization of uh, um, energy trade. And so uh, I think uh, in the future there will be uh, great, there will be greater attention to uh, countries to which countries we are dependent upon. It's a matter of diversifying sources, but also making sure that uh, uh, we are not reliant on sources that we consider politically um, unreliable. Yeah, which may be difficult as geopolitical tensions continue to, to rise globally and more and more countries find themselves sort of being dragged into this great superpower rivalry, as it's been described between the US and China. But let's finish off then with, with a final question, a bit of a crystal, uh, crystal ball gazing, if you will. Looking into the future, what will be the major sources of energy post-2050? I think it is clear that the role of renewable energies in general uh, and nuclear, I would add, uh, will uh, uh, increase uh, massively. Now, the, the real question is whether it's going to be the non-dispatchable renewables, uh, solar and wind, or uh, also some of the dispatchable renewables. I think we will have to rely more on the latter, and that means hydro, it means uh, geothermal. Geothermal is a very important source, potentially, which is uh, not uh, has not attracted sufficient attention so far. Uh, so uh, I am not uh, uh, convinced that we will all uh, be relying exclusively on solar. That's not uh, uh, what I expect. It is certainly going to be a very important component, a growing uh, component. But we all know that the sun uh, shines during the day and not at night. Uh, in uh, northern latitudes, it shines in, in the summer and not in the winter. Storing electricity is extremely expensive. So there is a limit to what you can do with solar and wind. And uh, you definitely need more uh, uh, reliable, dispatchable sources. And that means other uh, uh, renewables plus nuclear, I think there is an inevitable role for nuclear energy to be played. Yep, and that energy mix, something that's front and center, I would think, of many countries around the world. Uh, I think that concludes our interview for today. Giacomo, thank you very much for providing us with your insights into rentier economies and on climate change, and then also on the wider geopolitical in this, uh, uh, tensions and issues driving forward the politics around the energy industry. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And the Foundation looks forward to hopefully speaking with you again in the future. And of course, Last but not least, thank you all for listening. Be sure to keep up to date with all of the Alatea Foundation's work by following us on X, formerly known as Twitter, and on YouTube. Thank you.